How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Mr. John here again this time, taking a look at 20.9 electrolysis. Our objectives are to describe the process of electrolysis, how it is set up, its importance in modern materials, and quantitatively to determine the amount of work done during this process. There you go. Missing a comma. All right. Vocabulary. Electrolysis. What's that even mean? All right. Well, electro has to do with electricity, so you know... That we're going to have charges moving around and whatnot. And lysis means to split. Think lysosomes back in biology. Lyse means to break up. So it's basically we're just using electricity to break down compounds. Just breaking them apart. Okay? So big idea. We can get non-spontaneous redox reactions to occur by powering them with other redox reactions. So basically the voltage or the E external must be greater than the E of the cell. So we're making non-spontaneous things happen by coupling them with another reaction. So for example, here we got zinc being reduced and copper being oxidized. That's going to be a non-spontaneous reaction, right? Uh, we get a negative 1.1 volts on that, but we can make that happen if we applied more than 1.1 volts to it. So we apply a voltage of more than the 1.1 volts and we'll get that reaction to occur. We can make that happen even though it's non-spontaneous. We're using another spontaneous reaction to power a non-spontaneous reaction. So electrolysis of molten salts. Let's say I had some sodium chloride salt. And I want to split it up into sodium metal and chlorine gas. Okay, it's kind of crazy. Sodium metal, highly reactive. Explosive in presence of water. Chlorine gas will kill you. But you react them together, you get sodium chloride, and you sprinkle it all over your food. What if we wanted to get the sodium and the chlorine back? All right, so we need to melt the ionic compound so that the charges can flow and conduct electricity. Right now, the sodium chloride is a solid. Charges are locked into place. They can't move around. They won't conduct. But if you melt it, then they will. So you melt that sodium chloride. You get molten sodium chloride. And then you got to insert some electrodes. And they got to be inert because you don't want them to react with this stuff. Otherwise, you can't do the reaction. You're getting a side reaction, destroying your electrode. So you hook up some inert uh, electrodes. Usually they use like graphite or, uh, you know, carbon, essentially. And you hook it up to a power supply. So notice the power supply. Electrons come out of the anode of the battery or the voltaic cell, our power source. So that's going to be the anode, right? So the electrons come out of our voltaic cell's anode and they hang out on the electrode in the molten salt. The electrons build up on the electrode and attract the positive sodium ions. So the sodium ions are going to be attracted to those negative electrons, um, and they're going to get reduced by those electrons. So the electrons reduce and the cations and the cathode of the electrolytic cell. So this is the anode for the voltaic cell, and this is the cathode for the electrolytic cell. Right? A cathode. Why is that? Because that's where reductions occur. So sodium metal is going to form there. Because the sodium ions are getting reduced and you're going to get a bunch of sodium forming there. Okay, well what's happening at the other side? Well, chlorine ions are going to be attracted to the other side because it's the positive terminal of our voltaic cell. So notice the positive. The positive is going to extend to the electrode down here. So that's positive. It's going to attract the negative electro or negative anions. And our power source is going to strip those anions of their electrons. So the chloride ions oxidize. That makes it the anode of the electrolytic cell. And the chlorine ions are going to be reduced and become chlorine gas, which is going to bubble out in that solution. Bloop, 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 bloop. Right? So that is our anode of the electrolytic cell. All right, so electrolysis is molten salts. Need a very high temperature to melt the salts because ionic compounds typically have very high melting points. So why not just use solutions with them? Why can't we just use sodium chloride solution? Then we got mobile charges and we can reduce them, right? Well, when we do that, we also need to look at whether or not water will oxidize or reduce because it's in there too now. All right, so let's take a look. Electrolysis, electrolysis of aqueous solutions. So let's say I had sodium fluoride solution. Right, so I dissolved that. I got sodium ion, I got fluoride ion. Well, what can be reduced? Well, in this solution, I know I have the sodium ion, which can be reduced, and I also have water, which can be reduced to give me hydrogen gas. Well, which one is more likely to occur? Well, I see that the 
reduction of sodium has a negative 2.71 volts and the reduction of water has a negative 0.83 volts. Well, which one is going to happen? Hmm. Well, since water has a higher or less negative reduction potential, it's more likely to be reduced. So between those two, which one's going to be reduced? It's going to be the water. So this process will occur at the cathode of the electrolytic cell and sodium will not be reduced. It's just going to be the water that gets reduced. All right, so the electrons are going to come out of our power source, our anode of the power source. They're going to build up on the cathode of our electrolytic cell, and it's going to interact with either the sodium or the water. Well, water is more likely because it has a um, less negative reduction potential, so we're going to get hydrogen gas there. All right, what about the other electrode? Again, sodium fluoride uh, solution. So what can be oxidized? Well, we have fluoride ions, which can be oxidized, or we have water, which can be oxidized. So we look up the potentials for them. So the reduction potential for fluorine is 2.87, and we're talking about oxidation, so I got to negate it. Same thing with the water. I'm looking up reduction potentials, but I want to know for oxidation, so I negate it. Uh, and I get right here, I get negative 1.23 for water, and I get negative 2.87 for fluorine. Uh, so which one's going to happen? Well, the one with the less negative potential will be easiest to oxidize. So which one's easiest to oxidize? Water, right? Because it is less negative. It's going to be easier to oxidize. So overall reaction is we're going to pretty much oxidize and reduce water. We're going to break up water. We're going to take water and we're going to split it up and we're going to get hydrogen gas on one side where the cathode is because we're reducing the hydrogen and we're going to get oxygen gas at the anode because we're oxidizing there. Uh, so overall, what we're really doing is we are breaking apart water, electrolysis or electrolysis, right? So using electricity to break apart things. All right, so to clarify, voltaic cell versus electrolytic cell, this is getting, a, this could be getting a little confusing. All right, so the voltaic cell is going to be that top part in, our, in my diagrams where it, it's the thing that's providing power. All right, so it produces a voltage. It has a positive voltage. It's the negative terminal will be the anode for the voltaic cell. And the electrolytic cell, which is this bottom half, it's going to be a little bit of flip-flop. So it requires voltage. We're making a non-spontaneous reaction occur uh, by using the voltaic cell to power it. And in this example, the negative terminal is the cathode. So the positive negative gets switched up between the voltaic and the electrolytic cell. Uh, that's really the big difference, but electrons will always flow from the anode to the cathode. So do I have an animation for that? No. So always flowing from the anode to the cathode. And then again, from the anode to the cathode. That is always true. So if you ever ask a question, you know, describe the flow of electrons, safe bet, always saying from anode to cathode. All right, electroplating, electrolysis with active electrodes. So what it means by active electrodes is it means that these things are actually going to be interacting. In the electrolysis of salt, we used inert ones because we didn't want them to. But in electroplating, we do want those electrodes to react. So which will reduce? Well, I have sodium, I'm sorry, not sodium, nickel sulfate solution. So I have nickel ion, which can be reduced. And I also have water, which can be reduced. And I looked up the voltages for uh, the reduction potential. Which one's going to be more likely? Well, I get negative 0.28 volts versus negative 0.83 volts. The easier one or more likely one to occur will be the nickel, right? So the electrons are going to come out of my voltaic cell into my electrolytic cell, and they're going to build up. So because nickel is, has a less negative reduction potential, it's going to be the one that gets reduced. So I get nickel ions going to right here. I have a a steel spoon that I want to plate with shiny, pretty nickel. So I hook it up to the negative electrode and I pl flow some current through. And let me replay that, right? The electrons go through, the nickel ions get attracted to it and are reduced onto uh, my steel spoon, coating it in nickel. Okay. Well, what's going to oxidize? I can oxidize the nickel, right? Because I have the nickel electrode or I can oxidize the H2O, the water. All right, well, which one's more likely to occur? Well, this nickel is going to give me a positive voltage for oxidizing, so it is going to oxidize. So what I'm also getting is I'm going to get nickel from the electrode, losing its electrons, and becoming oxidized, 
and dissolving into solution. Pretty neat. So what pretty much just happened was we took a nickel from solution, we plated it onto the thing we wanted to coat with it, and part of the nickel electrode uh, oxidized and dissolved to replace what we used. So, right, there you go. So overall, we have nickel ion and nickel metal becoming nickel metal and nickel ion. Net reaction, uh, voltage, overall potential is going to be zero, right? It doesn't make sense. Why is this happening? Because we're making it happen. What was accomplished? There should be an A there. What was accomplished? What was accomplished? We coated our steel silverware with nickel. Pretty cool. Cool. Alright, so quantifying this process, we're getting into the math, alright? <clears throat> so we know that a mole of electrons has a particular charge, and we need to distinguish between the difference of a mole of electrons versus the mole of the substance that's undergoing the redox reaction. So, for example, if I'm using sodium, well, okay, it's pretty straightforward, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. For every one mole of electrons, I'm reducing one mole of sodium atoms, but it's not always going to be that way, All right? So if I had calcium, well, I know that I need two moles of electrons to reduce one calcium ion. So two moles of electrons will reduce one mole of calcium. So we need to be aware of that. All right. We also need to realize uh, and remember that one mole of electrons is equal to that 96,500 coulombs of charge. We need to also know that a coulomb is equal to one amp times a second, or you can think of this. This is how I remember it. One amp is one coulomb per second. So an amp's measuring like flow of charge. And you also need to know that one watt equals a joule per second. Okay, some new units, some units in terms of other units. And you need to know that a joule uh, is also a coulomb volt, a coulomb times volt. Okay. And we're going to talk about these things, kilowatt hours, kilowatt, so a thousand watts for one hour. So basically you take a thousand watts and let's try to convert that to joules. Well, I know that there are um, 60 seconds in a minute. I know that there are 60 minutes in an hour. And I know that a watt is, one watt is one joule per second. So now I've fixed all my units, right? Watts cancel out, seconds cancel out minutes cancel out and I'm left with um, joules I cancel out hours somewhere there we go all right so one kilowatt hour is 3.6 times 10 to the six joules sample problem how many grams of aluminum can be produced by the electrolysis of molten AlCl3 at a current of five amps for one hour so first thing we need to think of well what do we want this is how my brain works with all these kind of problems so what are they asking me what am I trying to get I'm trying to get grams of aluminum. All right, well, what do I know? Hmm, well, what do they tell me in the problem? They tell me that I got five amps, and I know that amps is the same thing as a coulomb per second. Uh, I also know that one hour is 3,600 seconds. I know that aluminum has a GFM of 26.98 grams per mole, and I know that aluminum is going from plus three in the compound to aluminum metal, which will be Al0, so I'm going from a plus three to zero. So that tells me that there must be three electrons being transferred. Um, and I know that one mole of electrons equals that 96,500 coulombs. Whoop. So let's think about this. How can I get two grams of aluminum starting with five amps or five coulombs per second? Well, let's see what I can do. I know I can use the amps and coulombs per second, and I can use the hour and seconds so that I end up with coulombs per hour. Um, I know that I can use the moles of electrons and coulombs to figure out how many moles of electrons that would be. I can use the fact that I know that I need three moles of electrons for every aluminum. And I know that for every aluminum, I have 26.98 grams per mole. So that's kind of my flow chart in my brain. So it's going to look like this. I start with 5 coulombs per second, because that's 5 amps, right? And I'm going to times it by 3,600 uh, seconds per hour, because I want seconds to cancel out. Right, so now i got coulombs per hour, and it's nice because it's asking me for one hour, so perfect. I know that one mole of electrons equals 
96,500 coulombs, so coulombs ends up canceling out. So now I just figured out how many moles of electrons would be transferred. Well, I know that I need three moles of electrons for every mole of aluminum. So now I've canceled out moles of electrons and I'm left with moles of aluminum. And now I just got to convert to grams. So I use the GFM to do that. Moles of aluminum cancels out. And I get beep bop, beep bop, boop, 1.68 grams of aluminum. So that's all you got to do with these kind of problems, all right? Different kind of problem. How many kilowatt hours are needed to produce 500 kilograms of aluminum by electrolysis of AlCl3 if the applied EMF is 4.5 volts? Okay, well, what do we want? We want kilowatt hours. What do we know? Well, I know that I need 500 kilograms of aluminum. I know that one gram is, uh, or 1,000 grams is a kilogram. And I know that aluminum has a GFM of 26.9 grams per mole. Okay. I know I'm going from AL plus 3 to AL0. So that means three electrons are transferred for every aluminum. And I know that one mole of electrons equals 96,500 coulombs. And how am I going to do this? Oh, right. I know that one joule is one coulomb times volt. And I think I know something about kilowatt hours. I know that a kilowatt hour is 3.6 times 10 to the 6 joules. So how am I going to do all this? Well, First things first, I'm probably going to go from kilograms of aluminum to grams of aluminum. And then once I got grams of aluminum, I'm probably going to go to moles of aluminum. And then once I got that, I know I need to get it in terms of probably electrons. So I'm going to use electrons. Um, yeah. All right. So once I get that, I know that one mole of electrons is that many coulombs. And from coulombs, I can get... Boom, in terms of joules and volts, and then I can use the volts that they give me in the problem to figure out kilowatt hours. Um, doing a terrible job at this, I'm sorry. Okay, I got 500 kilograms of aluminum. I'm going to times it by 1,000 grams per kilogram so that I get grams of aluminum. Where's my pen at? All right, cool. So, boom, I get grams of aluminum. Now I'm going to use the GFM so that I get rid of grams and I get moles of aluminum. Now for moles of aluminum, I can figure out how many electrons I need for that. So I know three moles of electrons for every mole of aluminum. So I can now cancel out moles of aluminum. I have how many moles of electrons I need. Now I need to somehow figure out how many electrons, um, or how long that would need to happen, how, many, how much energy that would need to happen at that EMF of 4.50 volts. So I know that... Each mole of electrons is 96,500 coulombs. So I can cancel out moles of electrons. I got charge. Well, now I also need to remember that a coulomb volt, I'm sorry, a jolt, a one joule is a coulomb volt. So now I'm canceling out the coulombs. But I'm still left with this volt. So that's where this 4.5 volts is going to come in. I got to times it by 4.5 volts so that my voltages cancel out. And I'm left with just joules of energy. Now that's where I'm going to use this conversion factor to convert joules of energy to kilowatt hours. So know that one kilowatt hour is 3.6 cents 10 to the 6 joules. Joules cancels out. I'm left with kilowatt hours. And now I just plug and chug. Put it in your calculator. Press equals. Get the answer. Write it down. And I get uh, 6,710 kilowatt hours. All right. So to summarize, things to know. You need to know one mole of electrons has 96,500 coulombs of charge. You need to know that a coulomb is an amp times second. You need to know a watt is a joule per second. You need to know a joule is a coulomb volt. And you need to know kilowatt hours is 3.6 times 10 to the 6 joules. <clears throat> you also need to know the definition of electrolysis. Things you need to understand, things you need to get, and things that need to make sense to you. You need to understand how electrolysis works. How are we using electricity to break apart compounds? How are we using electricity to power non-spontaneous reactions? You need to know the differences and similarities between the voltaics and the electrolytic cell, okay? Uh, and you need to understand how to determine what reaction will occur at the anode or the cathode of electrolytic cells with aqueous solutions. Which one's more likely to be oxidized? Which one's more likely to be reduced by looking at their potentials, all right? Um, that's it. Hope you found it helpful. See you in class. Goodbye.